name's uh, Ethan Winner de Mesquita. I'm a, uh, I'm a faculty member at the Harris School and, and also the deputy dean. Um, and uh, so, so let me just say, I'm really happy to be here. I'm uh, in a very, you know, I'm, I'm, my own my own work is uh, primarily on security issues. Um, I work on insurgency and uh, counterterrorism. I'm also. Um, I'm, I'm married to a, uh, a, a, a nonprofit startup uh, founder, and so uh, I've spent a lot of the last five years hearing uh, elevator pitches and transitioning from founding boards to operational boards, and how you go from being a content creator to managing people. So uh, these are topics that have somehow become near and dear to my heart, even though I have no entrepreneurial instincts myself. Um, but I'm, I, I know how important these things are. Um, so what we wanted to kind of focus on today uh, as best we could is to try and provide some perspective on how people working um, in, in applied security questions um, could engage the academy. And so um, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a couple pieces to that that are, that are worth highlighting before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, so, so one of those is, I think, a, a common sort of issue. So I think the academy provides a lot of, of opportunities and a lot of resources for people interested in working in these issues, both, um, both in the private sector and in the public sector. Uh, and, and in particular, as some of you may know, I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, the academy is a, is a wonderful source of free labor, because academics are um, motivated primarily by questions that we want to answer, and we're willing to work on them pretty hard if we think that there's something uh, interesting at the, at the end of the tunnel. And so the question is how do you engage an academic who wants to work on a question in something that you're interested in? And so I think uh, these guys' presentations are gonna give you some more perspective on this, but what I, I just wanted to highlight a few kind of points which in my experience working, um, I've, I've, I've done a fair bit of work with people in the practitioner community in one way or another, um, some common pitfalls and then some common things to be aware of to make, to make what you're interested in more attractive to academics um, who are typically interested in you know, kind of the analytical side of these things. And so um, I think there's, there's sort of two ways that you motivate an academic uh, to get interested in your project. And I think the common mistakes involve uh, not hitting on either of these when, you, when, you, when you're talking to, when you're talking to that professor. Um, because the, the academics are not by and large practical people, and so they're not necessarily motivated by the outcome they're motivated by. They're typically motivated by one of two things. One is like there's some question about how things work in the world that they want to answer that is relevant to the thing you're trying to do, and you have some resources available to try and answer that question, right? So framing things in terms of questions that are interesting to academics is sort of the first order thing to get an academic interested in the project. And the second thing, and probably the more practical version of that, is that academics are motivated by data that they don't have access to, right? So in the security space, you know, in the post 9-11 world, there's been a huge investment of academic resources and academic time into studying security issues and studying counterinsurgency, even at pretty practical levels doing program evaluations of of you know military, you know big program evaluations of like the commanders of the emergency response program, of uh, the national solidarity program in Afghanistan, right? Practical program evaluations of what was the efficacy of these kinds of interventions, where did they work, how did they work, or not work, um, and those people got engaged because parts of the military or the Department of Defense were willing to release data to academics that that allowed us to answer questions we cared about that we couldn't answer without the data. And, and so that's where the trade is, right? Where that's where the, where I'm very happy to work on these things, right? And we're not kind of consultants, right? We're happy to work on these things, um, you know, as part of our academic uh, uh, efforts because there's data that lets us ask, answer questions that if we're not partnering with you, we don't have access to. And so I think those are the, those are the kind of the, 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 the two ways in. And I think the common mistakes are to think about academics and approaching academics um, to get interested in a project in a way that is more like you would approach, say, a business, which is, not, which is not typically the right thing. Academics are typically motivated by a different set of concerns. Um, so, so, so I think the way then to, to know how to engage the academy, to have these group of partnerships, and I do think they're important on both sides. For the academy, they're important because uh, they help us understand what are the right questions to ask, and they help us get access to information that we don't otherwise have. 
have. And for the practitioner community, I think the academy brings a bunch of analytical skills. It brings certain kinds of habits of mind. Um, and it brings some time and space to think hard about important questions that, that people in more operational settings might not have the time and space for. Uh, so I think these partnerships are, are important on both sides. And so I think in order to sort of have those, those partnerships be fruitful, we need to spend a fair bit of time together understanding what motivates both sides so that we can understand where there are in fact gains of country to be had. And so the goal today is to, is to show you a little bit about what, what two of my colleagues um, are working on and thinking about in, in this space, you can get more of a sense of what are the kind of mechanistic questions that motivate us, what are the kind of data that are useful to, for, useful to the academy and might also be the analysis which might also be useful to you for the kinds of questions you're interested in. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I have two colleagues um, ben, uh, here, Ben Nessing, who's a, a faculty member in the political science department at, at Chicago, and Luis Martinez, who's a, a faculty member uh, at, the, at the Harris School of Public Policy, and they're going to each spend a bit of time giving you a sense of the things they think about um, and how they think about them, and then we're happy to just open it up to questions and let us talk. So I think Ben's going to get us started. Great. Thanks, Ethan. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me over today. I, just to follow up a little bit, on, pick up on something Ethan said, I often find, you know, we academics are famous for speaking this sort of strange language that doesn't make sense to other people, sometimes seems to be designed to have not made sense to other people. Um, I often find not being an entrepreneur myself or even being married to one, uh, I find the same thing. I often don't understand what people in the startup world are even talking about. I don't know the terms and uh, I don't really know sort of even the goals they describe. Uh, this also happens when I talk to young people. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm just going to today sort of talk in my language, and please, in the Q&A, if, if something I said didn't make sense, I, this is a very unfiltered uh, little overview of what I do that I'm going to give, but, uh, you know, so hopefully it makes some sense, and then feel free to, to, to sort of ask me to explain what I was talking about in the Q&A if it was of interest to you. Uh, so I, I'm, I work on a field that is really sort of nascent uh, and, and not well established, which I, I call or think of as criminal conflict. And this is sort of organized, sustained, armed conflict involving criminal groups as opposed to what we traditionally think of armed actors as being often insurgencies or militias or other politically motivated groups. Um, and my focus is Latin America. I've spent a lot of time in Latin America uh, even before I became an academic uh, working on security related issues. And so I think anyone looking at Latin America, certainly over the last 30 or 40 years, it's pretty clear that we went from a world where civil war, rebel insurgency, often uh, ideological, sort of left-wing, right-wing, uh, even proxy wars, has really sort of given way, uh, not that it doesn't exist, you know, the FARC are still out there and so on and so forth, but it's really given way to a world where the principal threats to security are coming from organized criminal groups. And it's not even, it's even a little bit strange to call them organized crime because in the US context, organized crime can be pernicious, but it's not particularly violent in the sense of attacking state forces, killing police or mayors or public officials or doing terrorism campaigns. Uh, but in Latin America, criminal groups engage in this kind of violence and on a sustained basis quite frequently. And probably the, the most uh, relevant example of that in your minds, and certainly in mine, is, is Mexico over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, you know, really sort of transformed into a battleground uh, with some 70, 80,000 people killed in this drug war. My particular areas of focus, one is precisely that sort of militarized drug war situation. And in particular, I focus a lot on what I call cartel state conflict. So these are you know, sort of long, drawn-out conflicts in which state forces and, and drug trafficking organizations are engaged in sustained uh, armed conflict over, over can often be you know, significant periods of time. And Mexico is a leading example, but of course Colombia, particularly the 1980s, is another well-known example of this. And my own sort of specialized area of research is in Rio de Janeiro, which you may or may not know has also had a, a very violent con ongoing conflict for really 25 30 years, so basically a generation. Uh, 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 and with often, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a city, it's not a country, but I would say, I would argue, pretty high levels of violence on the order of three to 4,000 deaths per year over a very sustained period of time. So I sort of try to understand what motivates drug cartels to, to fight the state, really, uh, to, you know, with, with, with bullets and, you know, sustaining enormous losses over time. 
I also work on a couple of other areas uh, that have to do with criminal organizations. In particular, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, prison gangs, which might not sound terribly dangerous in the U.S. context, although we have some of, we have, you know, there are very powerful prison gangs operating in the United States, uh, very well organized prison gangs. But in the Latin American context, they're actually very dangerous. Very, uh, you know, often controlling uh, enormous prison populations, eight, something, hundreds of thousands of people. In, for example, Sao Paulo's prison system is thought to have about 400,000 people prison in, in prison, and virtually all of those prisons are under the control of a single criminal organization. And in 2006, that organization. Uh, launched a wave of attacks in Sao Paulo, uh, in the streets of Sao Paulo, that shut the city down for three or four days and really held the, the, the government hostage to their demands, which were eventually met and the violence stopped. So it gives you a sense of the kind of risk that these groups pose. Their leaders are already in prison, so it's not clear what you do to fight groups like this. Um, so th those are sort of my areas of research. Let me say a little bit about how I work. Uh, there's definitely an empirical component to my work. Of course, I, you know, I do my own data collection sometimes. I've done coding for newspaper reports where official data wasn't available. Also, to pick up on something Ethan said, uh, when governments make data available, it's obviously incredibly useful. But there's a lot of problems with that, uh, particularly you know, moving away from a US context. Some of these governments have maybe not the best data collection, or it's very opaque. You don't know the quality of the data. They release and then retract data on based on sort of political uh, decisions. It's not often made by operational people, but rather politicians. So this happened in Mexico. The government released a giant data set of, of drug war deaths and then recanted it and then re-released it a few months later and then decided they would never again do that. So we have this data set that runs up until 2011 and then just cuts off. And we don't know what happened after that. Um, Okay, but that's only a piece of what I do, and I would just say, you know, to kind of bring you into the crazy world of, of political science and academia, a big component of what I do we call conceptualization, which basically means trying to define, uh, come up with sort of clear ways to define the phenomenon that you're trying to study. And that might seem simple, but if you start to think about the, the line between what I mentioned at the beginning, political uh, armed groups and criminal armed groups, well, that's a very fuzzy line, and it's getting fuzzier by the day. You know, ideological groups, and fundamentalist groups, frequently make their money dealing in drugs, right? So are they a criminal group or are they ideological? Are they terrorists? Those names have huge political valence. So if you don't want to negotiate with a particular group, uh, you try to say that they're criminals. If you do want to negotiate with them, you say they're sort of freedom fighters or political activists or whatever. So there's a tug of war in the political realm over what to call these groups. I try to come up with categories that are analytically useful in the sense that do these groups behave the same way? Do they respond to state policy the same way? Uh, you know, do they face the same sort of incentives and constraints? And that process, you know, it might seem kind of weird and sort of sitting in your armchair philosophizing, but it can often be quite useful. Uh, and just to give an example, you know, when the drug war began in Mexico, there was some talk about, oh, are these insurgents? Are these criminal insurgents? And in fact, Hillary Clinton, when she was uh, Secretary of State, called them insurgents in a public speech and made a parallel to, to Colombia. And this turned into a huge diplomatic kerfuffle, uh, Mex Mexican government insisting they're not insurgents and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is not a civil war. So these concepts matter in the real world and they also matter analytically for how we think about these groups. I would argue they're not insurgents and if you think of them as insurgents, you're misunderstanding their goals. And then there's also a theoretical component where you know, I try to specify sort of causal mechanisms that lead groups to respond with violence or not, and why certain policies work and don't. Uh, so that's sort of how I work. Um, oh, I would just say on the conceptual level, another key point about that is if you don't have clear concepts and you haven't carefully analytically distinguished the kind of armed groups you're talking about or the kind of violence you're talking about, you run the risk of over-aggregating data. As scientists, we always want more data, we want more cases, because it gives us better statistical analysis, better, more power. But there's a very big risk uh, of putting together data in ca on cases that aren't really comparable. And then you can, you know, that can lead to spurious conclusions or correlations that, that don't really exist. And that can actually lead to bad policy that can, you know, have really negative effects. If, if, you, if you thought that what worked in one case worked in another, 
will work in another, and then it proves not to, that can be very problematic. Okay, and let me just uh, conclude by telling you about my current uh, project, which uh, together with a colleague in my department, Paul Stanilin, we've won a Minerva grant, so sort of tying this into the defense uh, community to do, and uh, we're, with this grant, we, we're planning to sort of put together our, uh, some of what I have just described my own research with, along with his research, which is on armed groups in South Asia, uh, into sort of a broader project where we sort of try to do what I just described on a, on a more global level or at least cross-regional level. Uh, we're going to try to catalog a very broad range of armed groups. Uh, it might include some insurgent groups, but the goal is to really go beyond insurgency and include a lot of non-traditional or non-insurgent armed actors, armed political parties, local militias, organized crime groups, prison gangs, uh, paramilitaries who are often very directly involved in criminal networks, and so on and so forth, across these regions, both to create a kind of descriptive catalog or database about these groups, which we hope can be useful. Uh, that's gonna be, you know, we do a lot of field work and sort of on the ground uh, local language research, so I think we can bring something to the table that maybe people working from the US only in English maybe won't be able to. Um, and then to sort of systematically compare these groups and refine uh, our, our sort of concepts about what different groups are and how they operate, and finally take to sort of a theoretical and empirical analysis of how these groups respond to different kinds of, uh, of state policies, uh, counter, uh, it's not necessarily counterinsurgency, but counter crime or counter militia sort of operations to get a better sense of, of how to deal with these new security threats that are emerging around. So I'll stop there. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or hear from Luis. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I don't have to be like this, right? <coughs> Thanks, Ethan. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Luis Martinez, and I'm, as Ethan said, an assistant professor at the Harris School, where I carry out research on government accountability and on civil conflict with a particular focus on Colombia, where I am originally from. So let me get things started today by sharing with you how happy I am that our President Santos has been awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize for his valiant efforts to end the long-running conflict that has uh, troubled our nation. So as, as Ethan mentioned at the beginning and as, as Ben also commented on, uh, us researchers, we are obsessed with data. Uh, so actually I should say that what I'm gonna, what, what I'm gonna tell you, uh, my story is gonna be a very selfish one that is gonna be mostly about how people like yourselves can provide us academics with useful things and then maybe eventually at the end, I will try to say a couple of things of why this might end up being rewarding for you as well, and my, why we might be able to have a mutually beneficial relationship. Now in this regard, I would like to start by, by pointing out, as my colleagues have already said, that data is the lifeblood for a lot of the research we do. And I would like to highlight to you why data is so important through, I would like to show you how improved data has allowed us over the last 10 or 15 years to make significant improvements in our understanding of one particular question. Now, the question that I have in mind has to do with the extent to which negative economic shocks trigger or aggravate civil or, or internal conflict. Uh, hopefully, I don't, I don't have to spend too much time motivating the importance of this question. Uh, but I can tell you this. Roughly 13 years ago, a very influential paper uh, documented a strong correlation between poverty and conflict incidents. This paper by uh, Fearon and Leighton argued that poverty uh, reduces the opportunity cost of recruitment and, and that leads to, that facilitates insurgent groups or rebel groups activities and that leads to increased conflict. Now of course, such a claim, uh, people like us, we think about it and we're worried about what we would call endogeneity. 
which is just a fancy way, a fancy word for the idea that maybe it is not poverty or worse economic conditions that lead to conflict, but maybe it's the other way around. Conflict leads to poverty and to worse economic conditions. Or a similar problem could be that countries that are both poor and conflict-ridden also have some other third characteristic that we did not think about that is what affects both things. So in order to get a good sense of the extent to which negative economic conditions trigger or aggravate conflict, what we would want is almost to simulate what an experiment would look like. What we would like is to find some type of little button or little lever that we can pull or push that affects the economy and see whether that, how does that affect conflict outcomes of interest. So one first significant contribution came one year later in 2004, and this was by professors Ted Miguel and Shankir Satyanath and, and their co-author Sergenti, who published a paper that looked at countries in Africa over time, and the paper exploited two things. On the one hand, these countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they depend to a large extent on rain-fed agriculture. And the second thing that they exploited was the fact that to a large extent we can think that weather shocks, when it rains too much or when it rains too little, that's kind of a random thing. That's like rolling a dice. And so what they said was, I'm gonna look at these African, we're gonna look at these African countries over time, and we're gonna see whether periods when they get negative weather shocks, does that, how does that affect the, their propensity to have conflict? And indeed, what they found was that there was a positive correlation between these two things. So when, when, when one of these countries whose agriculture depends a lot on rain-fed, whose economy depends a lot on rain-fed agriculture, when it doesn't rain enough or when it rains too much, then they show that domestic well, GDP drops and in consequence, conflict intensity goes up. But of course, here, if you think about the type of data that they're using, what they're doing is they have data at the country level. So in a sense, one row in their data set is, I don't know, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Another row could be Botswana, and I can't remember if they have the whole of Africa, but you get a sense of South Africa, Morocco, Somalia, Rwanda. You're pulling all of these countries together, and as you can imagine, say the institutional context in a country like Botswana is probably very different from what it is in a country like the DRC. So an exercise like this one is kind of assuming that the different units, the countries that you're comparing, that they're somewhat comparable units. So can we do better than that? A couple of years ago, 2013, uh, another very influential paper by Juan Vargas and our colleague Andrila Duve at Harris went a bit further because instead of comparing countries, these larger kind of heterogeneous units, it looked at Colombia and it used municipal level data, so subnational level data. And there the idea was, okay, so I'm gonna look over time again, but now instead of comparing across countries, which can be a bit controversial, I'm gonna compare municipalities from the same country. And so there you can make an argument that, okay, the institutions are probably the same, I mean at least say the national legal framework, for instance, is the same in all of these places. Now, remember, the question in mind was, does a worsening of economic conditions aggravate conflict? And so what they said was, was well, I can look at places where the economy is mainly a, a revolves around coffee, and I can exploit variation in the world price of coffee. So sometimes, for instance, it rains a lot in Brazil, coffee supply from Brazil drops, and that leads to coffee prices going up, and that has nothing to do with Colombia. It's just bad luck for the, for the Brazilians. And what they said was, furthermore, what if I compare two different types of, of events? On the one hand, I have these coffee-dependent municipalities, and coffee, being an agricultural good, is heavily dependent on labor. So going back to the initial intuition about, is this about opportunity costs, and so workers have a worse outside option, so they're more willing to work for these, for these rebel groups. They said, what if I compare what happens in these coffee-growing municipalities when the price of coffee moves around versus what happens in 
oil producing municipalities when the price of oil moves around. And so the point was, well, oil is capital intensive. You have a bunch of engineers from the city skilled labor that comes, pumps out the oil, and they go back home. The local labor, the local population is not as involved. So if the story is really about a worsening of economic conditions makes it more attractive for local populations to, to, to work for these organizations, then it should observe some type of asymmetry across these two types of shops. And indeed, that's what their paper documents. When the price of coffee goes up, local wages in these coffee producing municipalities go up, and FARC activity, guerrilla activity, goes down. So indeed, it appears to be the case that when local workers have a better outside option, they're less willing to work for these organizations, and the intensity of conflict decreases. Interestingly, when the price of oil goes up in oil producing municipalities, there is no significant change in guerrilla activity, which provides us with, with further knowledge or, or kind of confirms a bit our intuition about this opportunity cost story. Now, what they do find for oil producing municipalities is that paramilitary organizations, going back, going back a bit to what Ben was saying earlier, paramilitary organizations do target more local politicians insofar as they know that these local governments are going to get more oil rents. So they, they try to capture these, lo these local governments. So we move from country level evidence which was interesting, but was forcing us to say that the DRC and South Africa are comparable units to subnational level data, which forces us to say, well, is Bogota an eight million cosmopolitan city uh, comparable to remote Bojaja in the Pacific coast? Well, maybe it isn't, but you can drop Bogota, you can drop Medellin, you can drop the big cities, and then you're comparing roughly equivalent Colombian municipalities. Now, what's the state of the art these days? If you look, for instance, at a paper by uh, Nina Harari from Wharton and Eliana LaFerrara, they've pushed it even further because what they have is they have very specific GPS data on conflict events, which allows us to take the whole surface of Africa and to break it down into a grid of whatever, one kilometer by one kilometer. Yeah. <laughs> you get the I point. Don't even know what is. <laughs> That's and what I mean about like I don't understand your language. <laughs> <laughs> and and so if imagine you take the whole of Africa and you split it up into this very small scale grid. And on top of that, you use not variation across years, but variation within years in weather. And so what they're able to show is that even within a subnational unit, say within a county or within a district, when you get a wet, when you get a bad weather shock, but not only a bad weather shock, a bad weather shock during the crucial growing months of whatever crop is grown in that particular grid cell, the the intensity of conflict and civil war goes up. So so as you can see, or hopefully in these minutes, I have convinced you somewhat of how us researchers, our ability to conduct research and our ability to test even more and more refined hypotheses improves dramatically the more and more we have disaggregate uh, data that varies within countries over time, within years, and so on. So I guess that my main point my main objective is done. I, would, I wanted to convince you that we, we love data. Please give us more data. Now, my second point, and I'll, I'll be quick about this, is that, of course, data is not everything. And in that sense, people like yourselves have vast knowledge and experience about how different agents involved in conflict <coughs> operate. And that, that can allow us to evaluate the extent to which the empirical strategies that we're exploiting, the extent to which they make sense or the extent to which they don't. So going back to these papers that exploit weather shocks, one criticism made by people who know what it, conflict actually looks like on the field is, well, when it rains a lot, it's muddy, and when it's muddy, that also makes it harder to fight. So this idea of rain affects conflict purely through its effect on the economy 
we can we can ask ourselves how valid that claim is because the weather itself affects conflict intensity. Now let me give you so I would say roughly to, to start wrapping up that on the one hand data is very useful to us, but on the other hand sometimes we have to deal with contexts in which in which data is not available. So some of my own research, for instance, has been on transnational insurgents. That is, insurgent groups that are able to operate across international borders. In particular, I wanted to test the claim that increased FARC access to Venezuela during the administration of Hugo Chavez, uh, that that led to more insurgent activity, more political violence, a worsening of, of, of local living conditions. Now, how to do that? I do not have data on the Venezuelan side of the border. I cannot say here is my GPS data on where the FARC camps are, but I do have subnational data on the Colombian side of the border. And what I do in that case is to say, and for this, for instance, it was very useful, uh, a very uh, rigorous and exhaustive dossier on FARC activities that was compiled by the IISS based on the seized laptop of FARC number two, Raul Regis. And so based on that and, and the, the accounts of FARC hostages, I was able to build a story where I said, look, these rebel groups, they do, they do not use mechanized transport a lot, and they do not have long range weapons. Which means that if they, have, if they want to attack a police station, they basically have to go all the way over there. They cannot send a plane or a rocket from 200 kilometers away, whatever that is the matter. So what I did was to say, let's suppose that FARC had increased access to Venezuela when Chavez was in power. Then their ability to exploit that safe haven across the border was disproportionately greater in municipalities near the border than in municipalities far from the border. So without ha so even though I do not have data on the other side, getting a bit of knowledge on how the FARC rebel group operates allowed me to design, a, a, to design an empirical test for the hypothesis that transnational insurgency leads to more violence. And indeed, what I find is that when Chavez was in power, FARC activity near the border with Venezuela increased disproportionately the homicide rate went up. And unfortunately, uh, local tax collection went down, which is a symptom of a worsening of economic activity. And educational enrollment rates went down as well, which indicates lower human capital accumulation. So uh, I've run out of time, but I guess that to, to wrap up uh, this final point, I would simply say that uh, hopefully my little example about Venezuela has somehow transmitted the idea that it's not all about data, but it's also about these, these more nuanced knowledge about the different incentives and the different uh, motivations of the different agents involved in conflict. That is also very useful to us. Thank you. All right, so I think we're going um, to open it up to some discussion. We only have time for one question, so uh, but the professors will be here through lunch, correct? So you can talk to them then. Um, so whoever gets the one question, make it a good one. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, I'm struck by, I mean, a lot of people in the room coming from a DOD context can talk about some very similar issues using very different language. Ben, I thought you said this. Well, kind of how different the languages are we use to talk about what in the end is the same thing. We're interested in similar goals. Maybe what are your thoughts on how we got so different? And what are some examples of good translation? How do we get from a language perspective kind of back and forth from one to the other? Well, I mean, you know, you write a glossary, I guess, is the most, <laughs> it's the most straightforward answer. But I, I mean, Part of it really is just translation. Uh, and you know, there's terms of art in every field, right? And so one of the nice things about being, you know, uh, when, you know, you go through grad school and you find yourself in a department, and you know, I can come talk to Luis or Ethan and I can say, well, look, I've got, you know, is the exclusion restriction met? And they know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So we've a, a very complicated scientific concept is boiled down into three words and we immediately understand it. People who work in entrepreneurship do the same thing. Like, you know, I don't know, 
price points or I, I, again, I, I don't even have a good example, but I'm sure that you, you guys can tell me at lunch. But it allows you to communicate very quickly a complex set of ideas. If those ideas are in fact uh, you know the same, and, you know if, if it's just like I always say, why well, just say price? Just price is the same thing as price point, as far as I can tell. So that's you know that's an easy one. But if it's a complicated idea and it's not one that your field actually uses or is familiar with, then you really need to sit down for a minute and yeah, kind of have some sort of boss with the people you're talking to. Make sure you understand their key concepts and they understand yours. And those concepts may be in not in full in full agreement. There's a lot of debate about what insurgency is or what counterinsurgency is. And so, you know, I think spending time working on that is a public good in, in many ways. It's one that once we begin to understand each other's language, it benefits everyone the same way infrastructure benefits everyone or something like that. So I'll say, I think, I mean, I think we, we use different languages because we're trying to do different things and it's efficient, as Ben says, to, to you know, when you sit in a room with military people and they speak almost exclusively in, uh, in acronyms, there's a reason for it, which is they all know what they mean, just like we all know what our ridiculous terms mean. Um, but I, I would say that I think that the, 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 the problem is that we try and cut into that at the wrong place. So I think the, the, the instinct of an academic is always to say, like, I've done a study, I have what I think is an insight, let me go and like brief some people on it, and maybe I'm gonna change their minds, and they talk like academics, and they brief on the wrong question, and nobody's listening, and like, and, and I think that's like how it goes. And I think the only solution to that is an institutional solution, which is that we need to start our conversations much earlier in the process. Like, so think informal settings, institutional settings, in which people across spectrums can talk to each other and get to know each other, and sort of develop a level of trust that there's probably some good intention to try and answer a reasonable question here, even if we speak different languages, that's gotta be the starting point. And so, you know, this is this is such a setting. I'll, I'll just, like, I think being aware of some of the institutional settings is useful on its own. So the Pearson Institute is an attempt at, at the beginnings of an attempt at such a setting. Uh, also in the security space, another organization that I'm involved in, the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project, uh, called ESOC. Um, which is a Princeton and DC based organization which attempts to bring practitioners and social scientists who are interested in kind of evidence-based approaches to security issues. Another such setting where people try and, I mean, there's briefings and whatever, like there's always, like there's, always, there's a lot of just attempt to talk informally. What are we all talking about? What are the questions we are worried about? What are the data we have access to? Why, why do we seem to be answering different questions, right? The, I, those, that's at the heart of the problem. And I think our mistake is typically uh, trying to get together only at the end of the process as opposed to way at the beginning of the process, which is where it's got to happen. Okay. Thank you again for uh, your.